we don't want to interfere at all. Like you never see Lou going on the tee and say you know, to John, oh, John, this is a three wood, it's not a driver for you. Oh, I, feel like a, I feel like a very specific example, but keep going. That would be a shocking move for <laughs> sure. I'm not, I'm not referring to anything, but it's just a... Uh, yeah. For play presented by Barstool Sport, Sports. I think I messed that up last time, too. Uh, presented by, brought to you by our great friends at Chevrolet, Barstool, Chevrolet, Foreplay, the whole deal, Chevy.com slash electric. We got myself, Trent Ryan, and our friend Danny Rapstar, who is uh, going to hopefully today be bringing a little closest to the pin action. Uh, and I think we have a big show because we're going to have also, uh, supposedly, we don't usually tease it before we've actually interviewed him. I think he's going to join in the middle of the show. We got Eduardo Molinari, who was the statistician behind Team Europe's victory, so we can get into the weeds about that. Um, and yeah, we got a lot to get to. So, um, hello, everyone. Hope everybody's feeling lovely today. Definitely. I got shit on by a bird. A bird shit on me. I, I saw, saw your story. Instagram. Yeah. Yeah, it happened. I, I, think, I think it's happened to me before, but this one felt like the guy really saved up and took his morning shit right on my shoulder. Just a massive one, massive one. It dripped down to. Are, is that supposed to be good luck? Is that right? That's what people are telling me. I put it up on Instagram, and people are DMing me, being like, "Oh, it's good luck. It's good luck." I think that's what people tell people who got bird shit on their chest. It's like you got to tell them something, and they'll just be like, "Oh, that's good luck." Same with and, like if it rains on your wedding day, right? Is that what they try right. to tell you? It's like if they're just no, trying that's... to cheer you up. It didn't bother me too much. I threw the hoodie right away. I just put it right in the trash because I the bird shit on me right as the train was pulling up. So I couldn't, I didn't have time to go back to my apartment. I just had to get right on the train. Otherwise I would have been even later than I already am. So I just didn't have any paper towels or anything. So I just rolled that thing up and threw it away. Dude, imagine birds, like how, how freely they just shit. Like it's such an operation for us to shit. Like we have to go find a bathroom that's got four walls, closed door, locked toilet, water. We have to do the whole thing, toilet paper. They're literally just flying through the sky, shitting whenever they want to. It's tough, you know? I I thought it had rained last night. I was standing under a like a light pole, so I felt something hit my shoulder, and I thought it was just like a rain droplet from last night dropping down from the light pole. And I looked, and it was just a gigantic bird shit. So I my question is, mm. you know, when 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 us humans don't get a full wipe situation, you feel like shit for the rest of the day. Yeah. Are, do animals just that's just like kind of the the perpetual state of their behind is just there's like a little bit of you know a little bit of crust in there. Let me ask you this. Why are you not getting a full wipe? Like what would be the barrier to you not just wiping it to the point where you're you're you know, you're satisfied? <sighs> That's a really good question. Maybe um, you run out of toilet paper. I'm a little like sensitive. In the woods I'm a little sensitive. Just, I'm a little you know. sensitive down there. I'm a little <laughs> sensitive down there. So like when I go to these golf tournaments and they have these like bathrooms that are trailers it's basically it's like putting sandpaper in your butt and i can't i can only take so much of it before i tap out wow wow i would say it's pretty rare that you you don't get i for for a guy like me it's you're pretty much good the whole way but yeah like like you said in the woods if you're golfing or if you just run out of toilet paper that that's a nightmare but yeah i don't know how animals do it i think they it's probably a societal thing for us because it's like if you don't do this the right way People are going to be like, what's going on with this guy? Birds, I'm guessing, don't have those conversations amongst themselves. I could be wrong about that. Kind of amazing how often I feel like birds are, are pooping on people. Like that feels like it would, the, the amount of things that need to go right for that ha to happen and hit you where it hit you feels very unlikely. I Does think it I'm smell? on the other end of that. I think I'm on the other end. Really? I think I, I'm surprised wow. people aren't shit on more by birds. There's so many birds. You see them and they fly in these huge, there's just thousands of birds, and you would think that people would get shit on all the time. Does it smell? I really didn't interact with it very long. It happened to me. I had I got on on at Bayshore where I live, so come find me if you want your ass kicked. And then <laughs> it goes, <laughs> that, that's that's an Uncle Chaps joke. He that's a good one. It's <laughs> very funny. Yes. <laughs> so I go from Bayshore to Babylon, which is like a, it's a six minute train ride. So I literally got shit on train pulled up. I got on six minutes and I took it off immediately, rolled it up. And then when I transferred from Babylon to another train, I, there's trash cans of the, at, on the train. So I just are not on the train, but in between the tracks and I threw it right in there. So I guess a city where it's congested, people living on top of each other. That makes 
a lot more sense that people would get pooped upon by birds. I guess I was thinking like if every person was equally equidistant from one another, spread across the earth, it would. I'd be like, I feel like they would just miss people all the time. But in a city, the other I guess time, it makes sense. It is bringing me up my memory back now. The other time it happened to me was in New York City. So I, I, I would imagine it happens a decent amount in New York City because there are so many people. We're all kind of in the same space. Birds are just flying over the city. So you know, it happened to me today, and apparently it's good luck. So hopefully. I win the lottery or something. That'd be awesome. Yeah, it's definitely bad luck because like it's the fact that it happened is already bad luck. So you would have to have good luck to even neutralize it at that well, point. Well, that's what somebody said to me was um, your day can really only get better because it started okay. by getting shit on by a bird. So maybe I that's see. the luck part of it. It's just you've already had the worst thing. One of the worst things happen to you. So going forward in the day, you should be should be all right. And everything so far has been so good. So if you believe in even Steven in the luck department, they would be like, you're at a debt now, so you're going to be owed good luck going forward. So, okay. But then again, also my train was delayed, so I might just, it might just be one of the worst days of my life. Or you might have a ton of good luck coming your way. I hope that's, I hope that's right. Trent, I'm on a little website right now. Which and the one? website is... Uh, it's chevy.com slash electric and i'm looking at this blazer i'm looking at this silverado i'm looking at this bolt i'm pretty blown away at how handsome these things look the uh the all electrics this blue this got a uh this this silverado i'm looking at has like this matte blue Ooh. glow to it huh. matte is underrated in terms of a of a color if you're trying to like get your car matte is it's just something i would never think of whenever i've gotten a car i've just been like oh, i'll take like a a black or a, or a blue one but matte if you're gonna go that way people are that's gonna turn some heads when you drive by this thing is turning my head right now i'm looking at oh and then they got you click one thing on it clicked on the silverado i learned more it says first ever all electric silverado and they've got this matte blue one driving with like the rocky mountains in the background oh and the oh, the mountains have like snow on the top of it <laughs> Beautiful, baby. beautiful, baby. Uh, Chevy dot com slash electric. Go there if you ha- you know if you're not aware now. Chevy, the electric game. They've been in it for a decade. Um, they're at the forefront of this. They've been making making cars for a hundred years. You know the models. You love the models. The bow tie. How iconic and American it is. Go to Chevy dot com slash electric. Learn a ton more about their electric um, situation. Their electric dominance. Their electric history. Um, they've got this energy assist feature in. Um, intelligently planning your routes it tells you where and how long to charge up for it gives you real-time data about charging station availability they got all kinds of charging stations popping up um there's over one hundred ten thousand charging stations across the united states and canada and growing fast so do yourself a favor go to chevy.com slash electric right now to learn more How often is that train out there delayed? Uh, is that the LIRR? Dude, it's so crazy. It is the LIRR. And I've been lucky with it, I feel like. Lucky. We're talking a lot about that today. Because um, it's been seamless. I get on and it's it's like an hour, hour 10 from where I am into Penn Station. And it's been great. But then these last couple of times, it's just been, it's not been great. One of the times we went backwards for 25 minutes and I was like, what is happening? No one else was freaking out but me. And apparently there was some train in front of us that had an equipment problem and we were on the track of theirs so we had to back up all the way to find a new track to get into penn station it's been very reliable up until the last like two weeks it's been i don't know what's going on amazes me that they would need like a new track sometimes like it's like when they when you land on an airplane sometimes and they just don't they're like our gate the gates are all occupied you're like i I feel like you guys would have thought about this that's infuriating when that happens i'll tell you what and i've tweeted i've tweeted about this before but pilots are not allowed to brag that we got to our destination faster right. if there's not a gate open. If we have to right. sit on the tarmac <laughs> yes. for 25 minutes, I know I'm complaining about air travel, and that is insane because 150 years ago, everyone was traveling by wagons, and I get that. But when I'm on a plane and the pilot is hooting and hollering and being like, we got here so much faster than we were supposed to. How about that? Look at us. We're great. And then we sit on the tarmac because there's not an open gate. I want to lose my mind. I would rather be in the air. Have you had a few in your life really like solid smooth that went so smoothly flight experiences that you actually like felt really good about it like we were yeah we were talking about it jonesy was talking about it last night and jones like jonesy was like dude my way down here i had 
just a delightful flight experience. Yeah. Well, there's something I think about flying. Did he fly into Raleigh Durham? Yeah. Yeah, I think there's something about the LaGuardia to Raleigh Durham flight that just hits. Because I remember when we came down for Ryder Cup, I said the same thing to you. I was like, that flight was like an hour and 15 minutes. And it was like 30 minutes. To, it was easy to get the car. There's something about that flight. Because I, I think you're going to North Carolina. So you think to yourself, oh, this, you know, it's like basically flying to Florida, but it's not. It's like half as long. And it's a del- just a delightful flight. And also you're going to Pinehurst. And I saw Jones might – I don't know if Jones like – maybe there's some like uh, – you know, some like mushrooms in his coffee because he was posting some 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 uh, Instagram stories this morning that he seemed very happy. He was like, oh, this place always hits like I love Piner. So I think he's just I think he's just like in a bit of a glee. Yeah, state. I mean, look, right? North Carolina does do that to people. I think that's no secret. Like even when we were in Charlotte a couple months ago, which little teaser, we got a video coming out today, 2 p.m. Eastern time on Thursday. That's why we were in Charlotte. We were filming with four NASCAR studs, a little four man scramble. Uh, our boy Spider joined us as our fourth, who's kind of the NASCAR king and the king in general at Barstool Sports. So that's coming out on the YouTube ch- channel. These guys were amazing, amazing guys that we played with. Hilarious NASCAR um, uh, studs. The NASCAR uh, championship, I guess. What I don't know exact t- exact title of the event, but it's coming up in Arizona uh, early next month, which we're going to be at as well. So a lot of NASCAR stuff going on. But anyways, we're in Charlotte. I think everybody was talking about, like, I could just move here. Like, North Carolina has a very peaceful, lovely, like, kind of feel in general. But I I still think it's just there's something about the satisfaction of a travel day that involves a flight when it just goes everything. He said, like, the Uber got me there, like, in record time, it was smooth. The drive was smooth. When he did get there, he got right through checking bags, right through security, got to grab like a coffee and then walk to the gate and they were boarding and nobody was like holding anybody up. And then the plane took off. And I do think when you get that rare experience, it is very like it's like enjoyable for some reason. <laughs> I think people are tuning out right now, and this is a case study in that you don't you don't watch the news and see oh here are all the the car accidents that didn't happen today. Yeah. You know, it's it's just yeah. like uh, it's like great, yeah, cool. Like I want to, they want to hear you rail on American Airlines for losing your baggage. Yeah, that's probably true. That's probably true. The news is not full of that. Do we? Did Trent, <laughs> yeah. da- Trent Daddy freeze? He is frozen for me as well. He appears frozen. Can he hear us? Can you hear us, Trent? He's Alex actually Bush. in the office, which is one of the one of the. Um, the historically <laughs> ironic yeah. parts of Barcelona sports that is the internet is usually worse at the office where we're an internet company it's been that way for like 10 years but um so yeah we got that video coming out hopefully we got water molinari on the show and then we're also we were talking last night we're going to very soon i don't know exactly how how quickly we'll have this up and operational but we're going to have a podcast only youtube channel uh, that we're going to put all the podcasts on. And the reason we're doing that is obviously the uh, golf YouTube. We put a lot more videos out now. We're doing two a week for the rest of the year of us playing golf and doing golf-related stuff, the NASCAR video. We got Sand Valley coming out next week. Uh, and the way the algorithm is, we don't want to trick it. We don't want it to think that things are going differently than they should. And we have a very loyal ten to 20,000 people that watch every podcast that we put up. So we're going to just give them their own channel. We put all the full podcasts up, the full video, the whole deal. Uh, and those will not be on the Ford Play channel going forward. So those ones, you know, we'll have to just let people know. Bang, go subscribe there and get all those. But we're going to be doing that soon. So that's a little bit of a, logis- a logistical note. Yeah. You know, I, I was talking to Brendan about this yesterday because Sidegate came out um, on Monday afternoon. And, you know, the reviews are almost universally positive. People love the videos. But it's you know it's it's not performing it doesn't get as many views as we might have hoped and we were just talking it's it's just an interesting youtube has a lot of power they have a lot of leverage and you know it it seems like you know the 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 link between how good a video is and how many people watch it right now is it, it's not it's not as close as you would think you'd think oh this is a great video the youtube algorithm is going to push it out to a bunch of people you know for whatever reason that doesn't always happen so i think that they're they're hoping that this will um kind of give the algorithm a little like kickstart of like okay when we drop a video on here it's not just another you know four guys talking for two hours about golf it's actually a significant well-produced high production value video that deserves to be pushed out to the algorithm because i think we're just we're a little frustrated that you know some videos get pushed out and they do great and then other ones don't even though the people who do see them think that they're like incredible 
Yeah, I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're pwned by the algorithm. The algorithm just owns us, and we got to figure out, you know, we're trying to play the game. We agree, and we adhere and give all power to the almighty algorithm, and we're trying to figure it out the best that we can. Trent, we're talking about putting our, our we're going to have our, you know, our own podcast YouTube channel where all the podcasts are going to go. Oh, okay, yeah, we've talked about that in the past. Are we officially doing it? I believe we're officially doing it. I don't know exactly cool. how quickly we're doing it. Maybe next week, somewhere around there. But, but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna push everything because we got let's call it fifteen thousand loyal podcast YouTube watchers. Yeah. Still want them to be able to watch it, obviously. Um, but we don't want it to mess with the algorithm that's going on with our larger four play YouTube channel, which obviously is very different. Than well, the and also that like our sort of quote unquote competitors or, you know, other YouTube channels, they don't have the, the podcast cadence. They don't have the twice a week. We're putting out, you know, 95 minutes so that, you know, maybe the, maybe the YouTube algorithm likes that. Maybe they like the fact that, you know, when they put out a video, it's, it's, it's sort of bangers only. It's only these high production value videos. So we, you know, we are, we're competing in this YouTube golf space, but we have other things as well. So it's, it's a, it's a balance of, you know, where, where do you keep certain, pieces of content and so i i think this is a good move i agree we'll find out if it fucks everything up we'll just stop doing it and go back so uh all right a little bit of news we got a little bit of news uh live golf was determined by the official world golf rankings that they were denied they're not going to get official um world golf rankings uh rap star shaking his head he doesn't seem to be thrilled about it i uh, i presume is that right dan I, it's it's just i i i can't understand um how you can call yourself the official world golf ranking and just not figure out a way to rank these guys. I mean, there's, there's a dozen other websites that are doing it as we speak and maybe it's not perfect, but things change. And, you know, I think that the, the OWGR has this, this notion that seems to me to, you know, be sort of dripping in arrogance. That is they have to conform to us. We make the rules and they conform to us, but that's, that's backwards in my opinion. Like the, the the world ranking was founded to rank the current tours. Things change in, in the 25 years or whatever since it's been around, something new has happened and it is it is their duty if they want to continue to be the gold standard of ranking golfers to just fucking rank the golfers. It's just not that complicated. There are other websites that are doing it. And I'm not like a live guy. Like I'm, you know, I'm not a guy who's out commenting and trolling. It's just like this our one seems to be a no-brainer. In, uh, in Italy, our live guy. Yeah, I just honest, seems honest. to be a no-brainer, and I think a lot of the PJ Tour players who I've spoken to feel the same way. It's like I don't want to go play there, you know. I don't, and it's not like they should get the same amount of points. It's not like winning a live golf tournament should give you the same points as winning a PJ Tour event. I don't think anyone with a functioning brain can say that winning a live event is as hard as winning a PJ Tour event. But nothing, we're just going nothing. I hate to tell the official World Golf Ranking website. But they're a website. Like, just rank the golfers, dude. Exactly. Like, I don't understand. <laughs> like, they seem to have this arrogance about them, and you're right. And it's like, dude, we know we don't know who any of you are. We don't care. Like, you guys are now standing up, pounding your chest, saying Liv can't have official world golf ranking points when you are a URL that I go to and we all go to to check who is ranked where. Like, let's just do that. I don't now there there might be something about like they don't like the live format or something. I don't understand that. You got some of the best golfers in the world playing on this tour. Let's give them points. And so we can just all we want to know is who is the best ranked golfers in the world? What ranking are they? Where are they? And how are they ranked there? Like put them on the website and let us just look at it. I don't give a has, fuck about it all this. It has an politics. actual impact, too, because the, the majors still use the world right. ranking to fill out their fields. Yeah. So guys on live who won majors recently are fine. They're still exempt. Like, you know, Cameron Smith, Brooks Kepka, Phil Mickelson. But I was looking at it yesterday, like Patrick Reed's um exemptions are up this year other than the masters so unless he wants to qualify for the u.s open or the or the open championship he won't be playing in those taylor gooch who's been an excellent player on live is down to 187th in the world and like crashing he'll be like outside the top 500 so it, it might not be an issue if this framework agreement becomes a concrete agreement and everyone's back plan but in the meantime like I don't see how the majors can if can use the OWGR and get the best field possible. Like it might, maybe they need to invite the top ten guys in the live field. Like once once this framework agreement happened, we, we got to throw out this like live is this like warring entity. It's just it's just like not really true anymore, and I, I can't understand. Well, it. I, I would say like the the issue is that there is this true reliance on this website. Why does that exist? Why doesn't the U like how have we not gotten to a point where the USJ and the RNA or the USGA, PGA Tour, whomever, just come up with a ranking system that we then just use for all the stuff that we're talking about. Why is it this website that has this fucking ranking system that doesn't 
do anything else. It's no different than us just coming up with an algorithm and releasing our own rankings and, and except imagine if the whole golf world was like, yeah, that's how you get into the masters actually is based on that ranking. That would be fucking crazy town. So I don't understand how that is still the case. I don't understand how the bigger entities and organizations that run golf and make the decisions in golf as they should don't have the power to do the world rankings and that we rely on this, this group that all of a sudden I never even heard of outside of going typing into the website and then they've got this board of like governors that was like, nope, guess what? Like you said, Taylor Gooch is not going to be able to play in the majors. Like, how, who is making that call? What are you talking about? That Taylor Gooch, like, the guy's sick. So I, that's outrageous. I do understand to a degree their point of one of their key points was that, you know, the, the, there's no access for people to get into live golf. It's not a meritocracy. And like, Chase Kepka, for example, I don't know if he still plays on live, but like Chase Kepka, if he's one of 48 people that are in these fields and live golf gets weighted, he's going to have all these world ranking points that he should never under any circumstances have. But just because he got on to live because his brother is Brooks Kepka, he get like, why would he be able to automatically earn points? So just by like playing because it's such a small field. So I understand that part of it is tricky, but that shouldn't be a barrier to they get no points anywhere for any of them. Like that should just be a little bit of a complication in their algorithm algorithm where they say, actually, we do something different. We don't give the bottom 25 finishers every week any points or something. I don't know what it could be, but it's crazy town that they have that much power. And it's crazy town that the live guys who clearly like DJ and these guys are some of the better players in the world. Everybody knows that. The eye test knows that. And they're just like, no, we're not that. They're not getting points. It, it doesn't need to be equal. I think that's, you know, I'm looking at data golf, which I've used, you know, for the past couple of years. You know, the highest ranked player on data golf who plays on live is Cameron Smith. And he's number 14. And Bryson DeChambeau is number 25. So you are going to be penalized because it's all true. You know, 48 players, you got the Chase Kepkas in the field. But, like, you're telling me you had a year and a half to look at this problem and they could not come up with a single way to rank these guys. It is, it's, it feels like something that would have happened a year ago. You know, it feels like, oh, you know, we're in the middle of this thing and, and everyone's taking sides. And if you look at the OWGR board, I mean, the guy, uh, Peter Dawson, who signed the letter yesterday, he ran the RNA until 2015. And Jay Monahan is on that board. I don't know if he recused himself, but it's like, it is the sort of power players. It, it, you know, it's the establishment. And it's just, it, it hurts the game, man. It just, it hurts the game. I don't know. And I, and I think players on the PGA Tour would say the same thing. We want to play against the best players in the world. They don't want to show up yep. to the Masters. And like, you know, damn, this guy who's won the last two live events or whatever it might be, isn't here because some guys in a boardroom decided that they shouldn't be here. It, it's, I, yeah, I, it's arrogant. It's very arrogant in my opinion to think that they have, that they have the standing Dan's in golf. Upset. I like they, upset you they are, have the, Dan. they I think like they have the standing nice. in golf, like to, to do that. Like that's not, it's backward. Like you, you cater to the tours, not vice versa. Talk about a board that thought this was going to be the easiest job of all time yeah. like three years ago four years ago ten years ago they're like we're there's one there's just a couple of tours we're all kind of like you said they're all the same players from the same places that like are on the board they're like we're gonna this is gonna be a cushy job forever and then live is like here we got 48 48 players chase kepka's in the field like they're like holy shit we don't know what to do so i'm with dan on this one i, I like that he's upset because i agree with him like it makes no sense that this league this tour does not get a uh, world, world official world golf ranking points makes no sense it does suck for the for the live guys i mean they're in saudi this week they don't have ranking points they were told they were going to get ranking points and and now they're in this kind of holding pattern i like if i'm a live guy i'm not happy right now yeah i mean it doesn't suck for live guys in the sense they've all yeah. took a massive amounts of money enough. And it's like oh like i don't i'm in saudi like no shit you're in saudi and your relationship to the rest of the golf world isn't ideal you knew that going in and you took a giant fucking payment so i you know i mean they can get over it i think I'm very thankful uh, every day, every time that I play golf, that somehow we got partnered up with G4 because my shoe game beforehand in the golf world, I would say, was probably about as lame as it could possibly be. But I, I didn't even really realize it. I just had like the most standard like white pair of golf shoes from a company that like my dad wore forever, and that's all I thought that was out there. Yep. 
I'm with you. And but then they G four changed the game not only on the outside but on the inside. It's that bubble feel. It, they're so comfortable uh, that the G one one twos have them. They all have this inside where when you put your foot in, you're living in luxury. And and no other it's golf cloud. shoe brand has for some reason replicated it. And G four has it, and they're the winners. It's just a cloud. You're walking on a cloud. You got your whole foot surrounded by a cloud. I, I don't know how they did it. We're uh, highlighting a shoe from G four. Uh, each month, this month we got the Galavanter. The Galavanter, it's for uh, a little bit more of a traditional look, but it, it it sports that traditional look and kind of the timeless feel and vibe. Uh, but it's equipped with all the comfort that we're talking about that your feet need for an on par performance. I I would call it my champ, you know, my championship shoe. It's like you got a big match. Maybe you're playing a bucket list course, private club. You're gonna wear a nice pair of pants. Wear these shoes because they look so good. But boy, are they also insanely comfortable. So no matter who you are, you're gonna love the Galavant. I see a bunch of them at the Barstool Classic. Every single person raves about them. Thank God I bought these. Thank God I learned about these. Or even if I didn't learn about them from you guys, I just love the fact that I that I have them and acquired them. So the Galavanter from G4 is as good as it gets. It's traditional, comfortable. You can check out G4 at g4.com slash four for 10% off of your first order. That's G-F-O-R-E dot com slash four and get 10% off your first order. And don't be afraid to check out the Galavanter. Do we think live golf exists in a year? I know we've had this conversation before and it's very hard to tell. No, it could change in a week. It could change in two days, but I just, I still have no idea where this thing is going. I think it doesn't exist in three years, but in one year, I don't even know how quickly they can move on all this other bullshit. Like, I think so. It might just make it through that, but no, I don't think it's like a long-term thing I think that'll what, survive. I think what you were going to see, and this is, this was the, I, I went back and read the framework agreement yesterday. Um, they said they're they gonna did. make it. They're gonna make That's like a, a little, good faith a effort. Light reading. Yeah. For... <laughs> I mean, it was only like a page, to be honest with you. It was, it was not. It was not that. It was not that long. Uh, <laughs> I ain't reading that. I'm not reading I'm that like, thing. No way. I'm rewatching like the Sopranos and Dan's fucking. Oh, I'm gonna lay here and just read. I got this TikToks. I gotta watch, pal. All right. I can't be reading <laughs> no framework agreement. I gotta I'm make, I gotta make right. TikToks, I got bro. We gotta. Fucking, we gotta be informed. Um, and they said they're gonna make a good faith we got, effort. We got TikToks of like scantily clad chicks dancing and like blow up pools. I gotta watch. And Dan's out here. Oh uh, yeah, what's that third paragraph? The framework <laughs> agreement again. Let's, I think I annotated that one last month. To answer your question, I agree with Riggs. I don't think they're going to be able to move anything that quickly. I think that what it, what it's going to the dust is going to settle is if Yasser is cutting a five billion dollar check or whatever it is. He and he loves team golf. I think there will be some sort of team golf series. It might be like you know the 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 team series, the PI, sponsored by the PIF, and there might be some events or things going on in the background. I do think there will be. I don't know if it'll be live branding, but I think there will be a PI a, a team competition that is very clearly sponsored by the PIF, which actually could be cool. Like I, if they do what I'm sneaky excited to watch the live championship, uh, the one in Miami. It was good last year. Remember Riggs? Like guys playing match play, two man teams. Like there is space for it, right? That's really the, I mean, that's the mistake that Liv made was they didn't go hard enough at the team aspect. And it was obviously surrounded by a bunch of shit that people were afraid to talk about. People didn't want to talk about and all that. But if you just have like a team series that is part of the schedule where it's like, all right, here's the regular PJ tour schedule. They're playing all these events that they regularly play, but then there's this other entity. And it, now it sounds like I'm describing Liv, but I, like I'm saying, they didn't do the team thing fully. I think that could be interesting. I really do. Yeah, it does feel like all of the headlines that you do get out of uh, Live Golf are about who individually won. I, I never, it's never a focus on the team breaks through, the team has this. And it does feel like Yasser is very, very invested into the team. He, he wants it to be Formula One aspect. He thinks that is it. It's just tough. It's tough in golf to replicate any team, you know, thing because we focus on the Ryder Cup. And the President's Cup occasionally when we have a really good one of how sweet those are. And then you try to compare that to any team aspect of like what Liv's done or whatever. And it's like, that's clearly not even close. I'm not interested. So it's a very, it's a hard thing to kind of be like, oh, team in golf. Great. Ryder Cup. Awesome. And you're like, then you'd put something out there that's not a fraction as cool as that. And it looks really lame. 
Right. They're going to run into the FedEx Cup problem where they're going to throw a ton of money at it and it's going to feel hollow. The Ryder Cup has built in nationalism. You're never going to beat that. That's as like as good as it gets in terms of rooting. They're just going to put a bunch of money on the line and it's going to be great for the guys that are playing in it, but it's going to feel a little soulless. I don't know. Yeah. I think if you had I think if you allowed the guys to choose their own teams and you had like a single elimination thing where it's like they play best ball or alternate shot or whatever it is and you've got, you know, Rory is playing with, uh, I don't know, Shane Lowry, and you've got JT and Spieth playing together, and it's one tournament every year for like 10 million bucks. I think the guys will get into it. I do. I think the guys will get into it, but I I don't think that has staying power, right? Like teams are, you're a fan of teams and you follow teams because it's everything. It's every game. It's the playoff standing. It's the draft picks coming up, and the offseason is just exciting as the real season because you're going through management. How are they going to build this shit? If you do like one fucking week a year, it just doesn't have like, in my opinion, it doesn't have like staying power for the whole thing. And so, um, so yeah, I, we'll see. I hope they can figure it out because I think team golf is fucking awesome. But I, I don't know. Like, it would almost be like the only way to do it would be for team golf to be the only golf, and that will obviously never right. happen. But it's like if that yeah. was just the only golf, it was like yeah, we're team sport now. <laughs> Lori and Scotty and Rom and these guys played on their teams every time they played golf. And it was like, that would be something I feel like that maybe could have some staying you power, can, but I, I don't know. Maybe do, I mean, this might be dumb, but the way the NBA does all-star games where it's, you have like, you would have Rory and JT drafting teams the way they do like LeBron and KD or whatever. And you steal that format every, like once a year they come together and they draft the teams that they want to have. And then they go up head to head. I don't know if that's even interesting or good, but that would might be a way to do it. Yeah, or we could just have four Ryder Cups every year. You know, you just <laughs> split them all the USA and Europe and just run it back, baby. <laughs> I would watch split them all. That. <laughs> um, yeah, me too. Me too. Uh, I was thinking earlier, I was trying to think earlier about who my, who's like, who's the guy this year in 2023 that was the guy that was like the player. Like in, there've been years, right? Like in 2000, 17 like jt won his first major he shot 59 he won back-to-back tournaments he shot a 60 whatever three in a u.s open he was like the guy that year and like rory whenever a couple of years ago that was like the guy and you had i feel like i guess it was scotty like last year who was the guy who won like four times and six starts including the masters and the whole deal and i was going through this year and it was like dude like there was it was it was Scotty at one point where he's he's been the number one ranked player in the world for a while. He won the players by whatever it was, six. It was John Rahm at the beginning of the year where he won the Masters and he had won a bunch. And it was like, this guy is going to go on a 10-year tear here. It was Victor at the end of the year where I still think at this point coming off, and he had an unbelievable Ryder Cup. So even coming off at this point, it's like, is it Victor Hovland where I, I don't think it is. He won the FedEx Cup. I don't. You can't really have it maybe unless he won – a major but like i think it we all agree he's the best player in the world right now is it rory like was rory the most consistent even if he didn't win as much as the other guys like i couldn't really put my finger on who i thought is like the guy from 2023 michael block <laughs> yeah the blocky <laughs> i was gonna I, say i would say it's probably rom i would say it's probably wrong just because you win the masters and you win three other times scott i mean scotty was sort of the the best player for the but you you just if you don't win a major it's really hard it's really, really hard to say it was your year. Yeah, I think it's Yasser's year. <laughs> it Yasser. Like it's just, yeah, if we're Ru- talking about who's making the most golf headlines, True. I think it's Yasser's True. year. Mount Rushmore of golf right now is like Michael Block, Yasser Al uh John Rahm, and you know maybe Victor Hovland if we're feeling nice. But I think those two guys are are firmly entrenched. Uh, yeah, Yasser is the guy. Like in 2020, I think it was it was clearly Bryson. Like he was, oh yeah, he won the U.S. Open. He made every headline, everything he did twice a fucking week. He was headline material. It was all we talked about on the show, and like we've had those years. And yeah, I just couldn't quite like pinpoint it. I really couldn't think on a golf front, player front. Who was you the guy know? This year. You know though. I know what you're saying. Like I remember early blogging days for me. Like 2014 was Rory's year. 2015 was Spieth's year. Like the years yeah. that people have, they just fucking stand out. And there might just be years where guys kind of pass the torch around. And I think that might have been one of those. This is one of those years. Yeah, the yeah. triumvirate. The triumvirate. If, if yeah, there's really kind of four guys. I mean, we we talked about the big three earlier this year with Rory, Rom, and Scotty. It does feel like Victor's earned his way 
into that. And it feels like all four of those are kind of. And I, uh, I even threw in a mitt. He's not the guy, clearly, but like Max Homo for a little bit, like at the beginning of the year when he won the yeah. Farmers and he had won twice last year and he had gotten inside the top 10 in the world. I lost was like, to Rom, started crying at Riviera. Everyone was like all over that. That's yep. right. There was like this guy is like Max Homa combined with his all the other stuff off course is like, holy shit, he's kind of has a chance here to be the guy. And then the fact that he had amazing President's Cup, amazing Ryder Cup, like I think in the near future he could be the guy. He might be like my, you know, I think a lot of people's pick, but like top pick going into next year to really perform in majors now, and whatever. But but yeah, it's like there's a handful of guys that you almost kind of looked at as like they were almost the guys, some closer than others. But it makes it very interesting going into uh, going into next year and all that other stuff. Who's kind of going to emerge? It's official. Fall is obviously here. Autumn is here. If you're like me, like us, you're settling back into a uh, a busier kind of routine back home. Maybe you've got kids at school, spare time filled, soccer practice, hockey practices, golf practice, seasonal activities. Your home may be sitting around empty and vulnerable. I know ours are because we travel so much. That's why we recommend Simply Safe Home Security and their revolutionary home monitoring innovation 24 7 live guard protection designed to help stop crime in real time. <clears throat> now, if an intruder breaks into your home, Simply Safe professional monitoring agents can actually see, speak to, and deter any ill doing intruder through Simply Safe's new smart alarm wireless indoor camera. How incredible is that? That's unbelievable. And, you know, you're a homeowner. Frankie's a homeowner. I remember when Frankie got his house. It's been a couple of years ago now, but he was like the first thing he got. He hit up Simply Safe and was like, I want to protect all of my stuff. And it's you just have to, you know, when you're not around we're like you said, we travel a ton. We leave our stuff behind and you want to keep an eye on things. And Simply Safe allows you to do that with their wireless cameras. I know Simply Safe can, you know, usually used obviously keep intruders out, keep bad guys out, <clears throat> security, the whole deal. They can also be used very funny for very funny ways. I have the Simply Safe at my home here in North Carolina. I've got cameras uh, on the exterior of the home. And I told I told the story before. We had uh, you know some locals in the in the village here were very upset at my lack of trash can um, efficiency. I guess with taking them out, put them in, and we bring them out. And usually I'm not here, so if somebody rents the house, stays in the house. They bring the trash cans out on Wednesday morning. And then they just wouldn't be here to bring them in, and the trash cans empty would sit out there. And people, the locals, that drives them nuts. And we had a, a vigilante local who was putting the trash cans into random places around the outside of the home. <laughs> and we ended up using the camera to find an incredibly funny screenshot of the guy lugging one of these big, like, industrial trash cans up the front stairs onto the patio of the home <laughs> and if it weren't for the simply simply safe cameras we, we would never have that footage and occasionally we're having a glass of wine or something out here on the back patio we always tell that story pull it up and we laugh out loud at this guy who's like a a well-dressed member of society he's got like a button that came, came from work probably a nice pair of peanut butter pants a button down on and he's just lugging this trash can up the staircase <laughs> trying to send a message to us so you can use it for all kinds of uh, good stuff but obviously security securing your home incredibly important so for a limited time you can get 20 percent off your new system when you sign up for fast protect monitoring visit simplysafe.com slash foreplay that is simplysafe.com slash foreplay there's no safe like simply safe eduardo's about to jump in in five minutes so let's do the um closest to the pin okay yeah okay let's do it all right, first one. So are we all texting Bush? That's that's how it works again? I pulled it up, yeah. Okay. The first one, we're going to start relatively easy here. The winning score in relation to par <clears throat> at the Shriners Hospitals for Children's Open. Mm. Do you have any uh, history on this? Do we get to look it up real quick? This this was part of my research when I was looking at the framework agreement last night. Yeah, but I'm saying, did you come up with anything yeah, you can it's share? Usually, we should all have the usually, same information, I feel it's, like. It's, it's usually in the like you know low twenties. It's it's a definitely like a scorable week. I think we might have some of the same guesses, unfortunately. All right, you want to go first, Riggs or, or, or Trent? Are you in? Yeah, yeah, I'm in. I selected minus twenty three. That's what I did too. Fuck. <laughs> That's okay. I mean, <laughs> yeah, there's we could three both others. Get half a point. We just might get both get half a point. 
I did 19 under, so I'm not even in the 20s. So I'm I'm hoping okay. for. So you're rooting for the golf course. course. I'm rooting yeah. for the golf course. Yeah. Trent's on yeah. the so side I'm, of the golf course this week. There's nothing I'm wrong with that. I'm in 19 under for that one. Yep. Okay. okay. Number okay. two. How many points will Alex Bush's terrible Buffalo Bills score at home this week against the New York Giants? Ooh. <clears throat> wow. I feel like I should get a guess on this one. You can get a guess if you want. You can get a guess. Um, they got they they lost their, their defenders. Bush, give us you know what Bush, give us a give us a little you know thirty second synopsis on on the state of the Bills right now. Yeah, I mean the the Giants are fucking terrible, but um, that wasn't the question. That no, I'm telling you, they're playing the Giants. Um, but they're they just lost their star linebacker for the year and star corner for the year. But that, that has nothing to do with how many points they're going to score because they're they well, their it could be a shootout. Great. They could need it. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, even if it's out of shootout, they're playing the Giants, so they should they should whack them. Mm. Trent, I'm going off. with okay. I'm going with uh, 24 points from the Buffalo Bills. Ooh, I think they're going to score some. I do. I mean, I don't want to put anything lower than that because I know that that Josh slow. Allen at any point is liable to just start firing bullets. So I'm going 24 points from the Buffalo Bills. I said 31. Oh, okay. I feel like that's a nice football number. Mm-hmm. Damn it! Four touchdowns and a field goal. A little bit. Uh, I went 38, so I went wow. high. Wow. I Get went right game. Sh- shootout. Let's go. Let's yeah. Let's just points on the board. Fun game to watch. I want Bush happy. I want him hooting and hollering. It's life's you know everybody's the world's better when Bush is a happy man. So I went 38 points. Pushy. Uh, all right. So I had a, I had a, I had a guess before all you. This was already my guess is 44. Wow. wow. I mean, they've already, they've already scored. Just shit I mean, on them? Come on. Yeah. They had I mean, like a three-game stretch where they scored like 130 objective. points. And they, they they blew out the Dolphins and they scored, what, 47, 40-something against the Dolphins? Yeah. Okay. Sunday Night Football. Right, so you're going on the high. I respect that. Okay. Question number three. You know, I, this was inspired by the Max Homa question, but I think this one will be less uh, open to uh, fuckery uh, and, and manipulation of the market. All right, there are there are seven preseason games in the NBA on Saturday. Okay, preseason. Okay. How many tweets will the official NBA account send? Retweets don't count, so it has to be original tweets where they come up with the content and hit send. Seven Ooh, wow. preseason games on Saturday. Oh wow, this is going to be a total pre-season. blind shot. <laughs> yeah, I don't really. Know. <laughs> I feel like the NBA tweets a lot. I feel like the they NBA do. very social All media forward. I don't even. I don't even follow them, so I have no idea <laughs> what they tweet once a day. I have no clue. All the leagues have been getting mm. more into, like, the NFL is all over Twitter now. It used to, it's so yeah. funny. You, those, like, legacy uh, leagues that have just been around forever, their their Twitter accounts used to be nothing. They used to never, ever tweet. And now they'll they'll tweet 15 times a day. Um, yeah. Yeah. NBA. Yeah. They're actually, they're actually going to tweet. Are you guys done? No. I'm done. They're actually going to... Okay, well, let me know, Trent. Fuck. Okay, I, I'm on. They're actually going to tweet 22 times on Saturday. That's the plan. Is that right? For, that's, that's what I've heard from the social media manager. So I went... Um, I, it's almost like I'm play, playing roulette. I'm at the roulette table. I'm kind of sticking with my numbers. I went 38 again. Yeah. So I went 38 points for the Bills, 38 tweets from the NBA account on Saturday. Well, I went 37 tweets from the NBA account. <laughs> so... You, so you, get any, you get anything from 20, you get anything from like 30 up until 37 is, is your golden. Mm-hmm. I feel good I about get that. Anything over 38 is a W. Anything. Yep. <laughs> I, think, I think you have to goad them. I think you got to, I think you got to start tweeting. I'm going to start talking shit to the NBA. I'm going to tweet, up, or no, I'm I'm gonna tweet up. What's going on out there at NBA? <laughs> <Yeah. Is> there... <laughs> Major blackouts all across the East Coast. Need <laughs> yes. play-by-play play updates. Can I please get an update? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. And the last one. All right. The ninth hole at uh, TPC Summerlin, where they're playing the tournament, is a very straightaway par five. It's about 550 yards. There's no water. There's a bunker right. There's a bunker left. Tom Kim is the defending champion. What will Tom Kim's score be on Friday on the ninth hole at TPC Summerlin? Just a number, his, his score. So not birdie part. What will his score be? Yeah, but the problem here again is everyone's gonna have like the same number. It's either gonna be a four think, or five. Nah, I don't know. Golf man, someone's someone's gonna drill all four, which I which I was excited about this week. Like someone's gonna have a perfect card, which I kind of wanted to leave. Not one of us, but someone in the comments will have a perfect card. 
Yeah. Okay. Let me think about this. How how far is it? 560 yards on the scorecard. It's not a difficult hole. Did you look last year or anything at like the I did like not look at scoring score average or anything okay. like that. I just okay. looked at the okay. I just looked at the Okay. Yeah, okay. All right. Okay. All right. All right. I said five. I think Tom Kim's making par. I mean, people, you know, I just think it's I think he misses like an eight footer for Birdie. <clears throat> okay. I uh I said four. I said four. I said three. Wow. Okay, there you go. Incredible. See, there Incredible. you go. <laughs> I almost went three to be that guy just going crazy Friday at Vegas. I'm just that's gonna be I'm gonna be going crazy. People are gonna be like, why is this guy going crazy when Tom Kim eagles the ninth hole at TPC Summerlin? I can't wait. <laughs> It's a, it's a big one. It's it's a big one. Uh, all right. Um. All right. Yeah. Someone will have a. I don't know. Perfect card would be tough. That Bills number could be anything, and the NBA tweets could be anything. Yeah. Yeah. I forty four from Bush was was a stunningly arrogant number. I must say for the Bills. That's just yep. you're setting your you're setting your team up for failure. That's O W G R Bush. We call him just yeah. an arrogant <laughs> arrogant guy out there. I can't wait to laugh at you about that. <laughs> all right uh all I like right it. we're back wow it's so exciting Every, see it's uh it's like the first tee of a golf round it's like you have a clean slate your your guesses could be perfect they could be horrific you have no idea it's brand new every week but is he bush is he is he waiting yep he's ready when you guys are all right okay let's do sweet it. i'll bring him in hello guys eduardo hello, how are you hey yeah. how are you we're doing great we uh we appreciate you joining us no thank you for having me how uh well congratulations i know it's been a few weeks now i imagine you've done a little bit of celebrating but uh but congratulations on a huge week thank you it was fun it was a lot of fun <laughs> i imagine it was i uh i just want to know how you got started into this you know statistical sort of obsession and you know career in the world of golf obviously incredibly accomplished player and here you are with the european Ryder cup team is kind of you're their you're their guy with the with the stats how'd you how'd you delve into this so deeply uh when i always uh, did my stats for myself for my own game um i started back in 2003 so i have a lot of a uh, lot of shots recorded a lot of data just about my own game and then uh, just before covid in 2019 a few guys that were playing mostly on the European tour, they asked me if I could be like a consultant for them or help them with their stats, their analytics. And so during COVID, um, I basically rebuilt the, the platform that I was using, uh, just make it a little bit easier to enter the data, a little bit easier to manage more than one player. Um, and then after COVID, uh, Fitzy was the first one to, you know, I showed him the stuff I was doing and said, yes, I would love to. I love to start with you, uh, and then he started to play well, and he started to kind of spread the rumor a little bit about what I was doing, and um, yeah, more players came on board. And then, long story short, uh, at the beginning of uh, 2022, so just after Whistling Straits, when uh, Henrik was named captain, I guess he was looking for someone to you know help him with the analytics, with the stats, with everything, and and probably heard my name through Fitzy, maybe through Victor. I don't know. Uh, and then he just called me and said, can you please uh, show me what, what you could do for the team? Because obviously it's a bit different, you know, doing for individuals or doing it for the team. You, there's like different areas you need to look at, different goals you want to accomplish. And um, so we chatted for a little bit. And then a couple of weeks later, he called me back and said, uh, I would like you to, to be in charge of all, of all this. And, and yeah, that's how it started. Wow. I, uh, so, so with the stats, how, how much of the database that you collect and that you rely on comes from the official stats that are listed and how much of it, or if any, do you have to either rely on players to take their own or have to go out and get on your own? Yeah, it's a combination of both. So for the players I work with individually, um, we obviously get everything from Shotlink, from IMG Arena in Europe, which is like the, the equivalent of Shotlink. And then they can add additional layers of information, like the breaks on the paths, where they miss the paths, because if it's a breaking path, it's kind of difficult to tell from Shotlink whether it was left or right of the hole, uh, which clubs they hit, uh, wind direction, where they were aiming as well, which is I'm um, quite, quite big on it, because then you can correlate where they're aiming versus where the ball is finishing um 
so they, they add additional information to it. For the Ryder Cup, we just, uh, we basically had for all the players, European players, American players, we just had the full database from Shotling and from IMG Arena, especially for the, for the European players, because we had a few playing mostly in Europe. And then you get the data, but then you, you, you know, kind of develop your own analysis, your own KPIs. And, and so, I mean, it, it's, it's much deeper than what you can see in, in Shot League, for example. Yeah, so I, I wanted to ask you about the, one of the things that you mentioned, which was about the target. And I remember this was one of the first things that I, Fitzy was on was that, you know, strokes gained approach uh, on the PGA Tour is all measured vis-a-vis the pin, yeah. right? And so can you explain how how it might actually be misleading? Let's say there's a, you know, a pin that's on the left side and you hit a yeah. shot that, that's close. Explain how that might actually not be what you were trying to do and how your program kind of sifts through that differentiation. So basically, uh, a very easy example would be the 12th hole at Augusta on a Sunday. The pin is always, you know, right uh, against the water and players are probably aiming 25 to 30 feet left, I would say. So what happens is if you hit a good shot exactly where you were aiming, you're putting from, let's say, 30 feet. So you're not gaining, you might be gaining a fraction, but not a lot. But actually, that was a perfect shot. While the opposite is you block it a little bit, you get lucky, you just made it onto the green, and all of a sudden you're putting from five feet. Now that second shot is way worse than the first one based on your intention. But if you only look at shotling data, it turns out that the second shot is much better than the first one. So what we what we did, um, yeah, starting with Fitzy, we started tracking where the ball was finishing in relation to his own target. And then we have like a strokes gain number to the target instead of the pin. Uh, so that's one thing that I think that's very useful for because it gives you the actual quality of your shots. So if it, on a Sunday at a major, you might you might not, not even be firing for one single pin, but then you keep putting from 20, 25 feet and you're actually playing some great goals versus someone that, you know, you might get lucky a couple of times and you pull one, you push one, you stiff a couple, you're getting two shots on the on the official stats, but your ball striking maybe wasn't as good as someone else who was putting all day from 15, 20 feet. Uh, so that's one thing. And then the other thing we look at is we kind of try to correlate how big your dispersion is with how many times you miss it on the short side of the pin, how many times you miss it in a, in a dead spot, like a, say a bunker where no one can get up and down. And then that tells you how aggressive you are. If you are too aggressive, not aggressive enough, kind of optimizing your your strategy into the greens and we do the same of the t and yeah there's there's a bunch of stuff you can do if you add a, a bit more layers to to shuffling so how much of what you do was applied to the golf course at marco simone and the setup uh versus yeah i know obviously a lot of what you did was what you just spoke about working with the players on the team to come up with how they should think about shots and aiming points and all that but how much was also was used to focus with the captain and the setup crew on the golf course? Yeah, we obviously we used the data for the golf course because uh, playing at home is one of the one of the advantages you have is setting up the golf course pretty much the way you want. I think uh, these days, I think since um, Hazeltine, I want to say, we don't have control on the pins and the tees. Uh, there's like one referee from Ryder Cup Europe and one referee from the PGA of America that sets them up. And they just tell you at the beginning of the week, these are the five pins we're going to use, and these are the possible tees we're going to use on each hole. Uh, and that's it. But then you have full control on the width of the fairway, the height of the rough, uh, speed of the greens, the firmness of the greens. I mean, so you, you can, you know, you, you can definitely have, you know, try and find a little bit of an edge. Um, having said that, uh, I would say this Ryder Cup was the first one in. I don't know how many years where the European team was a little bit longer of the T than the US. Accuracy wise, it was very similar. So that's why you didn't see the unplayable rough that was in, there was in Paris, for example, where you missed the ferry by two yards and it was just a hack out. I think in Paris, we were, I mean, I, I don't have the exact data for Paris, but off the top of my head, I would say the European team was much more accurate and a little bit shorter than the Americans. So they obviously try to set it up a little bit different. Uh, I think this time. So what what were the differences between the two teams that you tried to exploit this this time around? Uh, well, we we noticed 
obviously we started looking at the top players that we knew were going to be in the team six months away, nine months away. And we started to notice a pattern where the Europeans were way better from 175 yards and out. And the Americans were way better, especially inside 125 yards, but even inside 150 yards like shorter irons, wedges, they were definitely better. So then obviously we tried to set up the golf course in a way to kind of hide our weak area relative to them and try and exploit their area. And, and you know, you do it in, in very different ways depending on, on, on the length of the hole, depending, you can pinch the fairway, you can maybe put a new bunker in, you can build the new tee. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff you can do and, and it's it's quite tricky to get it right. But, you know, we played the Italian Open three times there. So we had a lot of data before with different tees. We could see which players were playing better, different holes. And I felt like we played the Italian Open in May this year for the last time. And I remember sending a report to Luke, say, two days on the Tuesday after the Italian Open and looking at how each part of the game correlate to scoring around Marco Simone. And... I felt like we just had the perfect setup already for the Ryder Cup. So we just try and, and replicate that at the Ryder Cup again. Are there uh, are there any instances where you tell the team, the captains, the players even, statistics are telling me these are the pairings or this is what optimizes the pairings, and the players might say, I really like this guy. I want to play with this guy, not that guy. Yeah, so uh, I think that the pairings was the most uh, was the most difficult part to get right, but it was also the the most fun uh, because it's a combination of things. You cannot only do it on stats on data, uh, so you need to look at well, start with data, then you look at like player personalities. We tend to ask the players who they like to play with, who they don't like to play with, and we're quite lucky because you know to be honest, our twelve guys. Very, very few said, I don't want to play with this guy. And they basically named, each one of them, they named three, four players they would really like to play with. But they said, if it's not one of these three, four, it's fine. It doesn't matter. I can play with anyone, which is obviously a big help. Because if you start looking at, you know, this guy doesn't want to play with him, then this guy doesn't want to play with him. It just, you have too many constraints and it makes it difficult. And then um, another thing we looked at was, uh, was the ball especially for foursomes, because uh, we had a few issues in the past where, you know, one player didn't like to change the ball, the other player, so it's it's always tricky. So we we started well in advance. We had the list of balls they played, you know, months ago already. And then about, say, a month before the Ryder Cup, yeah, we were in Ireland with Luke. Once the team was, was picked and, and defined, we just went to dinner every night with Luke and we were trying to, you know, I was basically telling him, look, these two are a good pairing in four songs. These two are not a good pairing. So we're trying, you know, find good pairings, get rid of the, the shit pairings because there are some shit pairings as well. And then look at the ball, look at, we wanted everyone to play on, on Friday. Uh, the other thing is we had some good four songs players. We had some good four ball players. So we tried to find the balance of, you know, everyone playing their best format. Obviously, we knew Rory, John, and Victor were going to play two matches on day one. Uh, and I felt like by the end of Ireland, which was like a week before, well, no, it was actually just a few days before we had the, our practice trip to Marco Simone. We just had a very good plan for Friday and something that we still had a couple of options that we could change if someone was playing very well, someone was playing very poorly. But like, you know, the plan was set and it was uh, something that we were very, very confident that you know, could deliver good results. Are there any like uh, are there any US pairings that came out and you would like go over to Luke and be like, <laughs> look at these idiots? <laughs> I I don't like to to name and shame, but there were uh, there yeah. were a couple of a couple of four some were a bit, uh, but uh, I would say I just, let's say good for us. Like when when we saw you know some of the four it was like, well, I think uh, we have an edge here. Do you the think that numbers because the Americans were just going on vibes and who they wanted to play with and they didn't believe in the data as much? Like, how do you explain, you know, you, you see a pairing that like on paper is clearly puts them at a disadvantage. How does that happen? You need to ask them. I don't know. I think, as I said before, I mean, it's, it's, you cannot only do it on data, but I feel, I think Rosie put it 
put it very well in, in the press conference. I think after the Ryder Cup, he said, in Europe, a good pairing is just someone that obviously you like to play with, but it's someone that it, it kind of fits the plan and fits the team. It doesn't mean you're just playing with your best buddy. And I think that's, you know, that's a very polite way of putting it. And But it, it's fair. I mean, it's, as I said before, like not one of our guys said, I don't want to play with him or very, very few. So like out of 100 and, you know, 144 possible combination, 120 possible combination, we could use 115. While, you know, I feel like sometimes just looking from the outside in, it looks like on the other side, it's a bit, uh, you know, he wants to play. I mean, we could almost tell on the, on, on Friday, we could almost tell how they were going to, how they're going to play foursomes, which I don't think it's you know, probably ideal, but then again, they uh, wanted I can to feel it. They were, I can feel it. They were laughing at us a bunch in that. We need a data totally. guy bad. Or, yeah, I can I feel just, it. I need a direct line to you during, like, when the gambling, when the odds come out, and I could just be like, this guy knows some shit. These are shit pairings. They got good pairings. Like, come, come on. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it is, um, it's, it's funny. Like, we try to, we try to put our finger on it. We're all USA guys. So we try to put our finger on it and we go over there and, and it's kind of a shit show every time. And it's like afterwards, there's a little bit of chaos and there's news stories and you're like, Oh God. But it is, it is, um, like marrying the data is, it seems like it is in good synergy with a team of guys that understand what being part of a team is which is not that you just play with your buddy like in you know yeah. football you guys are more into european football but it's like if you don't get to just tell the coach like my buddy is my friend so i he needs to be a striker with me out here they'd be like what the <laughs> yeah. fuck are you talking about like <laughs> these are our best players this is what's gonna happen and, and yeah and it feels like you know the european players by simply having what you just said where it's like you put me with anybody, whatever you say, coach, leader, captain, yeah. you know, let's do it. Let's go out and let's yeah. go out and get it, you know? Yeah, I think, I think to be honest, I think Luke was, uh, was excellent as well as that, at that because um, well before the Ryder Cup, he started to talk to all the players. He started to make them understand what he expected from them. Like we went the week of the Ryder Cup and I felt like most of our job was done. Like everyone knew what they, was, what they were going to do, uh, what they were expected to do. Um, you know, Luke, I think Luke was, was fantastic. Luke was very calm throughout the process, very invested. He basically dedicated the last year and a half of his life to this, uh, because even when he was playing events, he was like, oh, I need a press conference. We need to go to dinner with this guy. And then I need to talk to him about this. And then I need to go to dinner with the kid. This. And it was like nonstop constant. And, and I think he deserves a lot of praise for this. Yeah. It's, it shows, and it clearly showed uh, out there. Do you ever feel like your brain is getting in its own way? Like you know what you should do, what's good for you, but you just can't do it? Foreplay is sponsored by BetterHelp, and therapy helps you figure out what's holding you back so you can work for yourself instead of against yourself. Obviously, we talk a lot about bettering yourself a lot of focus on physical on trent jumping on the bike on going for a run on how you know pathetic we can get because we don't eat properly work on your golf game we're try trying to build muscle memory not talked enough about how important it is to work on your mental health and on your brain yeah i think society's starting to come around to that more and more like you're saying we all want to get in better shape we want to look better but you should put all that focus that you have on your exterior and the way your fitness is you should probably do that for your brain as well. You got to be mentally strong as well as physically strong. And it's just a very important part of everyone's life. And uh, BetterHelp is there for those people. It's helpful for all kinds of things, for learning positive coping skills, how to set boundaries, empowers you to be the best version of yourself. Um, if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire. Get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Make your brain your friend with BetterHelp and visit BetterHelp.com slash four today to get 10% off of your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash four and get 10% off your first month. You know, have you guys started yet uh, shifting your focus to Beth Page? 
No, but at the moment I'm, uh, you know, I'm still trying to play a little bit of golf uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, we don't even know whether whether Luke is going to do it again or whether it'll be someone else. Uh, so I think you know probably by you know during this winter we will have an idea of whoever is going to be the next captain, and then um, and then we just go from there. If they want me back on board, I'll be very happy to help again. If not, no hard feelings. I'll be one for one. Europe dominated the first hole uh, throughout the week. Um, yeah. I, and I don't know what the final statistics were, but but Europe, especially those first couple of days, it seemed to just dominate that first hole. And, yeah. and in the press conference, Rory said something like, I, I think he slipped something in there like the Americans all slice it or something. Can you give me some sort of information as to why the first hole played so much into the Europeans' hands? Um Well, a few reasons. Uh, I think the first hole, the overall score was... Uh, we won it 10 times, U- well, U.S. won it five times, and the rest was half. So it was like five-point difference, basically, at the first stop, which is the same at the end of the Ryder Cup, which is a bit crazy when you think about it. Um, I think, uh, so the first stop was one of the holes where we were trying everyone to lay back a little bit and have like a, a shot from 160, 70 yards. I, I, I don't have any data on this because we were not tracking the club they were hitting, but I have a feeling that a lot of the Americans hit driver while some of our guys hit driver maybe in the morning, but not in the afternoon. So they were trying to stay a little bit shorter to the to the wider part of the fairway, just having a shot into the green. Um, so maybe that's why um, I noticed we definitely hit more fairways at the first. And if you miss the fairway at the first, it's you're looking at trouble because there's like from the bunkers on the right you have a tree in front from the rough on the left you can't get on the green so I think hitting the first fairway was massive and I think Luke uh, Luke instilled the message to everyone players caddies that we needed to get off to a good start and so I think you know when you're constantly being reminded of let's get off to a good start let's get off to a good start let's you know start on the front foot then you know, in in the back of your mind, that there's something to it as well. Was there uh, w- was there real time decisions that you guys were making based on your work and the stats that you were bringing in on on what was going on? I mean, I know you a lot of things feel like pairings or so are kind of set or talked about, but would you Friday morning be feeding Luke information that would change pairings Friday afternoon or at least change pairings for Saturday morning? Yeah, yeah, we were we were obviously tracking data live as they were playing. And then um, you have to hand in the pairings. I think it was 11 a.m. every morning. Uh, so basically, the first guys were have, had already played 12, 13 holes, and the last guys only played nine, ten. Uh, but even with that data, you could tell like who was playing well, who wasn't playing very well, and we had like a very simple chart that you know we sent Luke and all the vice captains, where you just see it on a piece of paper. Right, this is you know this is this guy has been playing very well. This guy hasn't been playing very well, and so on. And then, as I said, we you know the plan was pretty much set in stone, and we had a couple of options to change. Um, so obviously, for example, we decided to rest Ludwig the first afternoon, and then he played the the second afternoon. I mean, mostly because he played eleven holes in the morning, so it was just a, a warm up for him in the morning. Oh, you had to get that in there. Yep, fair. Well, well, it was. It was. I, I was following that match, and it was. It was impressive. I have to say, obviously, yeah. that, you know, Scotty and Brooks didn't play. Didn't play well, but I think Victor and Ludwig in four zones. It's uh, you don't want to play against those two, because basically you're giving, you know, you're giving Victor a few more yards of the tee, same number of fairways. All of a sudden, he's probably hitting a club less into the greens, and you're kind of hiding Ludwig's uh, weakness, which is his iron play, his approach play. So all of a sudden you got you're playing against someone that even in foursomes they're gonna shoot six seven under every day, and on that golf course, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. <laughs> it's just a bloodbath. Yeah, it just feels like we just had no chance. Like six months ago, it feels like we had no. We you know yeah, it's it's amazing what all goes into it. You know, it's a, it's incredible what all goes into it. How how in depth, how seriously it's taken, how how prepared. The team is, you know, how, were there were there players that uh, were ever adverse to things that you were telling them, like first hole you need to lay back, uh, somebody wants to hit driver, or 
one of the drivable par fours where they feel better laying, you know, anything like that that you not get into it, but sort of have these debates with some of the players? Well, we, we had some of those debates in the practice trip and then again in the practice rounds. But then once the tournament starts, you don't want to, I mean, at least we don't want to interfere at all. Like you'd never see Lou going on the tee and say you know, to John, oh, John, this is a three wood, it's not a driver for you. In the, in that the, would be, you know, that would be crazy. In the heat of the moment, like a, I feel like, like a very specific water. example, but keep going. That'd be a shocking move. For sure. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not referring to anything, but it's just, uh, yeah. I think it's just, we do things differently and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, but I feel like, you know, I, I would really struggle with all the data in the world. I would really struggle to go to someone, even to someone I work with, let's say to Victor and go to Victor on a tee and say, oh, Victor. You know, with four hours to go, he's tied in a match. And I say, Victor, by the way, this is I think you should be hitting three with here because the data says like that. I mean, there's so much that goes into like the, uh, the feel of the player, how they've been hitting it, whether they like the shot or not. You can give them like indication. And that's what we did before the round, before the, even in practice rounds, I was discussing with some of them, you know, some holes, do you think this is driver? This is three wood? And depending on the player's strength and weaknesses, the format, you can kind of tell them. But then at the end of the day, it's their own choice and, you know, you have to live well, with I it. I feel like that's one of the reasons why the guys trust you so much is you've done it before. You you won the United States Amateur. You've won t- tournaments in Europe. You've played in a Ryder Cup. You know, I, I just, I remember uh, Zach Johnson was talking about, they have stats guys too, and they call them the nerd herd. And, you know, it was a funny like comment, but I, I, I do think it sort of speaks to this this mindset where they're like, these are, these are the stats guys. Like, yeah, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll listen to what they have to say, but at the end of the day, we're the players. Do you feel like you having that playing background gives you an extra layer of trust with these guys? Yeah, I would say so. And I got that comment a few times from, say, again, Fitzy, Victor. Uh, like, I remember specifically for this Ryder Cup, I was walking one day in a practice round with Victor on 15, like that long part four that goes up, dog back to the right. And he specifically asked me, he said, you know, do you think is it driver? Is it three wood for me here? And I was trying to, you know, explaining him that the data for him suggested it's a driver. But at the end of the day, he's on the tee and he, he needs to, you know, make a decision. But definitely. And then in the end, he just went with driver every day. And I think he always hit the fairway and, and it was fine. But I think with data, you have to be very careful because, yes, it's useful. But also, it's how you deliver the message and how the message gets across because otherwise, you know, you, as I said before, you have all the data in the world, but, you know, if the player don't trust you, then it doesn't really matter. What, um, so Victor is, you know, he's been a world-class player for years, but I think in the last few months, he really elevated himself to a lot of people would say probably the best player in the world right now, or at least one of the top two or three. What, what is it that's, that he's improved upon that's, that's different, that has elevated him to that next level? Well, obviously, short game. Short game was a massive uh, difference with Victor since he started working with Joe Mayo beginning of the year. It took him probably three months to get it right. But I think the numbers I have from, from the Masters onwards, so let's say from May onwards, he's probably top top 30 guys now in short game, which which is obviously great because it might, he was... He was poor. He would he would tell you the same. He would tell you he sucked at cheating. So <laughs> not scared to tell you. Yeah, uh, so that's that's the main thing. And I think Joe did you know Joe did an unbelievable job. And and Victor is just a perfect student because he 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 acknowledged that there was he had a weakness, and he just worked his ass off to to make it right. And and now he's I mean the cheap shot he hit on the first hole at the Ryder Cup is just insane. That was a real fuck you to every American in the world because he so was crazy. on the green. It was the first hole of the Ryder Cup. He's like, I'm going to chip it, and then it goes in the hole, and it's like, oh, this is a this is a problem. We have a problem yeah. on our hands here. I was I was standing right behind him with his dad, like 10 yards behind him, and I saw him reaching out for the wedge, and I turned to his dad, and I said, no, why, why a wedge now? I mean, it's, it's literally two inches off the green on a fringe with a big slope. Just hit a putt to six, seven feet. Ludwig is a good putter from shorter range. We're going to make a four. We go to the next. I mean, if he doesn't pull off the chip shot, it could be back to his feet or it could be off the green on the other side. And then we saw it going down and I see Victor starting to run to the right to have a look at the line. And I turned to his dad and I, and I said to him, just before the ball went in, I said, I think this was a good choice. 
<laughs> that was that was such a we're not at whistling straights anymore moment. Yep. It was like right out of the gate. It's amazing how in a Ryder Cup things can change. We, like the the start we got off the first day, it's just so massive because all of a sudden you feel like all of a sudden you're a better team. The crowds gets behind you, and then it just flips the story completely. I mean, I think if we didn't get off to a, such a good start, then it could have been a very different week. But in a Ryder Cup, I think it's it's massive to you know get off to a good start, get the crowds going, and then. It, I mean, you could tell it on the on the faces of the Americans, and I mean, the crowds didn't do anything wrong. That like, they were, you know, there wasn't any shouting in the back swing or any, you know, apart from the you know the, the head thing with Cantlay. But you know, it was just a you know bit taking the piss. It wasn't yes. respectful in in any way. Yeah. And but you could just tell in the, in the face of the Americans that oh, we're in for a long week here. If if we don't sort this shit out early, then then it's going to be a long week. And that's yeah, the way it is in the Ryder Cup, and I think that's why it's so difficult to to win away. It is. Yeah, you could feel it. You could feel it watching on our TVs. It was like, oh god. One of our favorite, most useful apps we've ever used, heard of. Uh, we discuss even we're not just on the show. We talk about we found this subscription, we found that charge. I can't believe how much the, you know we're spending total each month on this. And we're talking about Rocket Money. Rocket Money is a personal finance app, finds, cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors all of your spending, helps you lower your bills all in one place. We love Rocket Money, Trent. I love it. And I also hate it. And that's going to sound surprising, but it does. It tracks. It's very important because it tracks all of your spending, which is very cool. You can you can almost get lost in the numbers. You go on the app and you can just press all these different buttons and it shows you what you're spending on what. And for me, every time I just happen upon my Uber Eats monthly bill, I, I like want to throw my phone across the room. But it's better to have that information than to not have that information. And Rocket Money, it doesn't just do that. Like you're saying, it helps with the subscriptions. It helps with everything. It's an unbelievable app. It just shows you sometimes the darker side of your spending. It does. Um, and, and most people think they're spending $80 or so a month on subscriptions. In reality, that number is closer to $200. So when you're signed up for so many things like streaming services, um, you use to watch just one show or free trials for del- delivery you don't actually use. It's so easy to obviously lose track of what you are actually paying for. Rocket Money, you easily c- cancel the subscriptions and the ones that you don't want with the press of a button. So no more long hold times, any of that stuff. Um, so stop wasting money on things you do not use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions and manage your money the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash four. That's rocketmoney.com slash four. Rocketmoney.com slash four. How long did it take you to recover from the celebration afterwards? Uh, well, I'm, I'm not a, too much of a, of a party guy. Like, we would probably went to bed at 2, 3, 2, say half 2 a.m. Not too bad. I mean, some guys were still up there. Uh, I had an early flight to go back home to see my kids, which I hadn't seen in a few weeks. So I just went back home, and I remember having lunch with the kids, and I was just falling asleep at, at, the, at the table. <laughs> And I said, I'm just going to go to the bedroom one hour and then I'll be back playing with you. And I woke up, it was like 7 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> then so it was like, I basically slept, uh, you know, probably 18 out of 24 hours. And then mm-hmm. that was fine. But yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, I think what people don't realize is that Ryder Cup are very long weeks. I mean, practice sounds are fine. You just play nine holes and, you know, discuss a few things and that's it. But then once... Once Friday starts, I mean, Friday, Luke, myself, and a few others, they, we went to the course at like just before 5 a.m. And then you're leaving back for the hotel at 7 p.m. Uh, you go back, you shower, Jeez. dinner, and then same thing the next day. And I promise you, on Thursday night, I think, you know, I woke up at 2 a.m. and I was literally counting the, the minutes before we could go to the course. And I saw Luke having breakfast at the course. We had breakfast together. I said, how much did you sleep last night? And he goes, ah, three hours. I'm like, yeah, we're in the same boat. <laughs> it's all of fun. I mean, it's the adrenaline rush you get is just uh, insane. You got to have like 12 new clients. I, I got to oh. think that everyone who worked on that team after you, you know, it, it walked them through that week. I got to think that you're, you're a little busier in, in the stats work than you might have been a month ago. 
But I don't know. I mean, so far, I, I'm not pushing for it. I, uh, I've always said, you know, I'm not, I will never reach out to, to someone and say, hey, I, I, th- I think like you need my help. So if, if they want to come, great. They know what I do. Uh, I'm sure there will be some that will ask in the next few weeks and months. But, you know, I, I, I'm busy enough with the players I have now and I've been trying to, been developing like a new platform with a, an Italian company. Just, uh, I feel like I want to I wanna keep staying ahead of the competition. So we, we started to build a, a new platform with this uh, Delta Trace called this a company that does analytics in that very different sports. Uh, so I'm, I'm very busy with that. And if, if a few new clients come on board, great. If not, fine. Be very funny to get like you to do a full statistical breakdown and analysis on like my game. It'd be like, well, you know, you miss like every There's single no fairway. It's hard, short, right? <laughs> With <laughs> yeah. all of us, you never hit a green. You don't. Know, you never chip it close. You miss every putt low. So it's like, yeah, we got we just gotta work. On some stuff. You might be a bit got some work to do. I can I can ward it properly. <laughs> <laughs> Right, that's what he's saying. It's all about yeah. the messaging more than that's the right. data itself. So he might right. he'll hopefully yeah, be nice to you. Yeah, we found some things. We discovered a couple of things. I'd like to sit down with you for a few hours. Uh, wow, it is. Uh, it is. This is a fascinating element to probably you know most golf fans' favorite event of the year. Like you said, the energy, the crowds, how hyped up we get for it, the patriotism, the, the you know national, all of it is so so exciting. You get caught up in the hoopla and, and to really realize kind of the nitty gritty information details preparation that goes into it is uh it's such a cool element to it so so yeah i mean congratulations and it sounds like you uh you worked your you know you worked your dick off on this whole week (laughs) and it and it and it paid off yeah yeah it was a busy few months but it was well worth it and um yeah it's something that i would i would be really keen to to do again and, and try to help because it's uh I don't know why, but like in Europe, we, we kind of live and die for the Ryder Cup. It's uh, it's just in our blood. It's, I don't know. I don't know. It's difficult to explain why, but even when you see guys like Rory in the team room, I mean, you could, you could see how much it meant to him, how much he wanted to win. Um, even during the practice trip, like, you know, our practice trip, we was 12 players, 12 caddies, all the vice captains, even the buggy drivers were there. Which is like, you know, it was everyone was so much behind the team and and trying to make to do everything they possibly could to to help, and I think it, you know, in the end, it does make a, a little bit of a difference. We got to go with buggy. Buggy is such a cooler term than cart. And I also I really liked car park. I like I, parking lot seems like too many letters. I remember when when the Rory stuff was happening, everyone was calling it a car park. I was like, yeah, that makes that makes a ton of sense. I like it. Half two, you said half two earlier. That was a good one. You got, yeah, you guys, yeah, you speak, you speak more elegantly than we do. You have better terms for it. So, and you guys, you know, clearly, I everything you just said about how it, how much it means, it's in Europeans' blood. It shows. It's like clearly yeah. shows. I feel like, and yeah, and it probably helps. So, um, a good example would be on on Monday night when we got there in Rome. Um, Luke had prepared like a well, obviously not himself directly, but he spoke to a few people and he they they put together these like motivational videos, one different one for each of the guy, each of the players, and they all saw them, watched them in their room, and then they come down to the team room, and I promise you there was there wasn't one single guy who didn't have tears in his eyes, including Rory, including John, including everyone, and it was like, and then we saw. We watched like a kind of a highlight of all the 12 videos together. And like, I was, I'm not a very emotional person and I was really struggling not to cry. And then Thomas Bjorn was crying and then Olasa Bali was in tears from after five seconds. <laughs> it's so inspiring when you see, I mean, poor Jose, I mean, with all the, the savvy things and, you know, in the locker on the grandstand, I feel like he, he spent half of his week crying, but. That's just how much it means. I mean, so, some of the savvy stories were like crazy. Riggs, you would be a mess. A no mess. chance, dude. Matt, <laughs> thank God I wasn't born like in you know Europe with some tie to the European Ryder Cup team. I, if my face would fall off during this week, Jesus. Yeah, that's great. That's great. That's great. Um, yeah, it shows. It's very cool to witness and watch, even if we're you know we're on the losing side of it, but. Uh, but yeah, congratulations and, and great work. And we, uh, 
we really pre- I, I've, I have a hunch that you'll probably be involved in in some more Ryder Cups in a similar capacity going forward. If I had to I, guess, I, as I said, I really enjoyed this one, and if they want me to do it again, I'll be I'll be very happy to. <laughs> I, I, would be tough. We call it Mission Impossible, but you never know. <laughs> wow! All wow. right. Wow. Yeah. How uh, do you account for how do you account for Long Island knuckleheads in your models? <laughs> wow. <laughs> We might bring uh, earplugs to play. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Noise canceling headphones out there. Yeah. <laughs> we find the way. Uh, I think the guys are. I that you. I think you gotta have a thick skin, but I think it's fun as well. I think if you if you if you accept it's gonna be a challenge and and you you kind of face it in the right way, I think it could be a lot of fun. If you start, you know, mumbling about and be upset about it again. You're in for a long week, so you have to be careful with how you approach it. It's going to be fun. It always is. Um, yeah. All right, Eduardo, we really appreciate the time. And, um, yeah, good luck with everything going forward. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Eduardo. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.